from Carnegie Studios in Longmont, Colorado, it's Puppet News. Good evening. I'm Herman Hansen, and I just hope you're happy with yourself. And I'm Miranda Longerung, and this is Puppet News. Zero patience for the company of others? Anyone who's ever wanted their own private island getaway now has a chance, and it might be less expensive than you'd think. The only house on a small island in Rhode Island's Narragansett Bay, with the unique address of Zero Patience Way, has hit the market for an asking price of $399,900, the Newport Daily News reported Monday. The seasonal cottage on Patience Island is off the electrical grid, but comes with just under a half acre of land and approximately 600 square feet of living area that includes two bedrooms, a kitchenette, a half bath, and what is described as a picturesque front porch. A single solar panel does provide some electrical services, perfect for comfortable camping, getaways, amazing Airbnb potential, and more, the listing from Rhode Island Real Estate Services says. The cottage also has a unique address, Zero Patience Way. The island, officially part of the town of Portsmouth, is about one-third of a square mile. According to property records, the cottage was built in 1972 and has been owned by the same family since. The EPA has taken over management of the spill of unleaded gasoline on Highway 36 at the Apple Valley Bridge Tuesday afternoon, a tanker truck carrying the gasoline tipped over and began spilling the fuel into the St. Brain Creek upstream of Lyons. All of the water supply for Longmont and Lyons is being diverted at the Longmont Dam above the spill. There are no current or expected impacts on the city's treated water supply, Becky Scholl, spokeswoman for Longmont's Public Works and Natural Resources, said via email. The EPA has robust water quality monitoring program underway, Scholl said. Staff has also closed the head gate to the Oligarchy Ditch, so the impacted water will not flow through Longmont via the Oligarchy Ditch or reach Union Reservoir, the city stated Tuesday. The tanker truck was carrying over 8,500 gallons of gasoline and an unknown amount spilled into St. Vrain Creek, according to the EPA news release. There are also reports of significant fish kill three to four miles downstream of the spill, the EPA states. A German bomb squad called to investigate a suspected hand grenade in a Bavarian forest determined that the object actually was a rubber sex toy, authorities said Tuesday. A jogger reported finding a bag containing the device Monday in a forest outside the city of Passau, near Germany's borders with Austria and the Czech Republic. The discovery of forgotten or hidden munitions is still a regular occurrence in Germany more than 75 years after the end of World War II. But when a bomb squad arrived and inspected the contents of the bag, they determined that it was a rubber grenade replica. The condoms and lubricant in the bag helped inform the hypothesis about the device's intended use, police told German news agency DPA. An internet search confirmed the suspicion, police said. There are actually sex toys in the form of hand grenades. Longmont will place 30 parklets in the downtown area in May in an effort to make it easier for pedestrians and shoppers to spread out safely and enjoy Main Street, the city council decided Tuesday night. Council members unanimously voted to place the 5 by 20 foot parklets in parking lanes with supporting barricades separating them from traffic. Kimberly McKee, Executive Director of the Longmont Downtown Development Authority, or LDDA, told the council. The parklets will go up along Main Street at designated points between 2nd and 6th Avenues, McKee said. Locations were picked based on LDDA business and public needs surveys conducted in the fall of 2020 
and from follow-up meetings with Main Street businesses, according to a city staff report. The $300,000 project is funded through a $150,000 grant from the Colorado Department of Transportation and a $150,000 grant from the LDDA, said the staff report. Parklets built off of last year's lane closure plan on Main Street, implemented to help downtown businesses attract more foot traffic in the midst of COVID-19 restrictions, McKee said. Parklets will include single and shared outdoor seating with social distancing. Local businesses will provide the seating. Parklets will be aluminum and can be moved to different locations according to demand, McKee said. Local artists will be used to beautify the parklets, which will be placed along Main Street from May 5th to October 31st. A fight over the name of Josh drew a crowd from around the country to a Nebraska park Saturday for a heated pool noodle brawl. It all started a year ago when pandemic boredom set in and Josh Swain, a 22-year-old college student from Tucson, Arizona, messaged others who shared his name on social media and challenged them to a duel. Hundreds showed up at Air Park in Lincoln, a location chosen at random, to participate in the silliness. The festivities started with a grueling and righteous battle of rock, paper, scissors between Josh Swain from Arizona and another Josh Swain from Omaha. KLKN-TV reports that the Arizona student won that competition, allowing him to claim the title of the true Josh Swain. The pool noodle competition that followed was open to anyone with the first name of Josh. The victor of that competition was a four-year-old boy who was coronated with a Burger King crown. Swain, the organizer, said he is a little surprised about how the whole thing blew up. I did not expect people to be as adamant about this as they are right now. Authorities in Arizona have arrested a man who police believe severed his finger while slashing his neighbor's car tires after an argument. Maricopa Police Department spokesman Hal Couser said Kevin Johnson was arrested and identified as the owner of the finger found on his neighbor's driveway, the Casa Grande Dispatch reported Wednesday. Francesca Wyckoff told police she found the finger on April 15 after discovering her vehicle had two slashed tires on one side. Police said a trail of blood led to a nearby residence. Authorities said Wyckoff and her husband went to a neighbor's home the day before. She told police a male neighbor joined them uninvited and became drunk and aggressive. Wyckoff said the neighbor pushed and threatened her and her husband before being asked to leave. Johnson was arrested on multiple charges, including criminal damage, assault, threatening intimidating, and disorderly conduct. Online court records did not list an attorney for Johnson who could comment on his behalf. The finger could not be reached for comment. Born out of a personal passion in their backyard, the Long Tucky Derby is a tradition that Abbott and Wallace Distilling co-owners John and Stephanie Young have organized for half a decade, seeking to bring family, friends, and others in the community together. Visitors will be able to participate in inflatable Roddy relays or re races on inflatable horse toys, as well as a derby hat contest for a chance to win a bottle of bourbon. Laura Ann Langfihill, Longmont resident and hat designer, has been participating in the Long Tucky Derby since its inception. She has designed hats just for the occasion. The hat I wore on my first contest there is still at the distillery. For us, the event gives a feeling like family. It's quaint, not a huge to-do party like the Denver Derby party, and it's close to home, she said. With the return of events and parties post-pandemic, Lengthy Hill hopes more opportunities will arise to do more of the work she loves, she said. Young said the tradition started five years ago at his house as something he and his friends enjoyed doing while watching the Kentucky Derby. 
It was just a house party we threw, and when we were making the final decision on the name change of the distillery, it was one way to get the public opinion and our friends' feedback. People could cast votes, and that is how horses or the toys would move along the track, he said. It's not too often that tours of new buildings start with the toilets, but they're a big part of a different kind of building in Atlanta. And so, Shan Aurora, who oversees Georgia Tech's Candida building, troops visitors pretty quickly to a ground floor bathroom where the toilet begins to hum and then foam. There's no conventional flushing, with the toilets consuming only a teaspoon of water per use. And the waste is composted in digesters in the basement instead of being piped to a treatment plant. We say there's a lot of potty talk in the Candida building, Aurora said. Georgia Tech announced last Thursday, Earth Day, that the building has one certification as the 28th living building worldwide. That means the building has proved over a year of operation that it meets the standards of the International Living Future Institute that it does more good for the natural environment than harm. Sustainability gets us to a point where we're not doing as much damage as we are, Aurora said. But we've already done so much damage that we have to get to a point where we're regenerative or restorative. Paid for by a $25 million donation from the Candida Fund, the building is, above all, a demonstration project. It's meant to show that the technology is ready for wider use, especially in a southern environment. The Candida Fund is the private philanthropic arm of Diana Blank, the first wife of Home Depot co-founder Arthur Blank. It also provided $5 million more for programming to ensure the building gets used to its highest potential. Candida's goal was not really to build a building, said the Foundation's sustainability advisor, Dennis Creech. Our goal was to be a catalyst for changing how buildings should be designed. More than 5,000 people toured the building while it was still under construction. Creech said it will be impossible to track all the ripples from the building, but said he knows of two or three buildings now being designed that have been influenced by the Georgia Tech structure. The International Living Future Institute says a building should be like a flower, giving more than it takes. It prescribes requirements under seven petals. Place, water, energy, health and happiness, materials, equity, and beauty. It's the mindset of what's possible that may be the biggest change. For example, the building does not have conventional air conditioning. Electricity for cooling is typically the heaviest energy demand in the American South, with long, hot, humid summers. Instead, the building mostly relies on dehumidifying the air, making it more comfortable and less sticky while reusing water that is extracted. Designers also focused on keeping inside and outside air separate, meaning the building has few air leaks. Finally, there is a piping system that can pump cold water through concrete floors to cool the building if it gets above 78 degrees Fahrenheit. But Aurora said even on the hottest days last summer, the cold water system never turned on because the building never got that warm. Dexter Harper, a Georgia Tech air conditioning mechanic who monitors the building systems, said his co-workers were skeptical about the lack of typical air conditioning. When I first started, they said you're going to burn up at 78 degrees in the summer. That's the farthest thing from the truth, Harper said. Not surprisingly, there are solar panels. A large solar canopy shades the building while generating more than twice as much electricity as the building uses. There's also a focus on excluding materials that designers consider harmful. Even the big glass windows have dimples to warn off birds from accidentally flying into them. Builders diverted more material from landfills during its construction than new waste it generated, using old tiles from a demolished Georgia Tech building to cover the walls above the humming toilet in the bathroom. And it means foaming toilets. The building isn't connected to city sewers and is designed to be independent of the water system too. The building has gone through a long process to get permitted by the state as its own municipal water system treating rainwater for drinking. 
The canopy collects rainwater for the treatment system and sends additional water to be slowly released back into the ground instead of running off into concrete drains. Beyond that, the focus on health, happiness, and beauty makes the building a magnet for students. On Tuesday, biochemistry doctoral students Jay Haynes and Brooke Rothschild Mancinelli were in the rooftop garden tending the vegetables. It wasn't for research, but just for fun. Once you know better is possible, how can you look back? Asked Aurora. Vale's first bear report of 2020 came on April 20th last year. The animals seem to be sleeping in a bit this year. As of Tuesday, no bear sightings have been reported in Vale, but those reports are coming. Brian Gadbury at the Vale Police Department said it may be a while before Vale's first bear. It may be a while before Vale's first bear reports start to trickle in, but the animals are starting to stir and warm. But the animals are starting and to... And that's all we have time for. For Puppet News, I'm Hanson Mann. And I'm Miranda Longerung. Good night.